Hi, everyone. My name is Niftali. I'm a third year student at Northwestern. Um, I've been really involved with my intercultural department as an intern. I'll be interning again next year. And the topic of racial injustice and social injustice has been a topic really close to my heart. Um, and I'm glad Brian reached out to have me read um, from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to, re to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you are too being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by, this, by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. A picture paints a thousand words. A single photograph can tell a powerful story. Take this photograph, for example. Have you seen it? Do you know the story behind it? It's an iconic photo from the 1968 Summer Olympics that were held in Mexico City. The two black men are American runners John Carlos, who's on the left, and Tommy Smith on the right, who won the gold and the bronze in the 200 meter race. Now, 1968 was a tragic year in the civil rights movement as both Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated. Carlos and Smith took the podium barefoot, a symbol of their solidarity with African Americans who were experiencing poverty and oppression. The black gloves and the raised fists were a gesture of the Black Panther movement, one of the branches that were part of uh, the overall civil rights movement. And the white badge on their shirts next to the USA read Olympic Project for Human Rights, which represented a movement of athletes around the world who were standing up for equality and justice for all people everywhere. It was a bold and courageous act, what, what Carlos and Smith did in this moment with the entire world watching. This symbolic gesture of, of protest and defiance in the face of injustice. And they paid the price for it. Smith and, and Carlos were immediately suspended from the American Olympic team. Uh, they were expelled from the Olympic Village. They would never be allowed to race again. At home, these men and their families faced heavy repercussions, and they received multiple death threats and all kinds of hate mail. But what about the white man in the photo? What about this man who, who won the silver medal? Who is he? And is, is he part of the story? Most people don't realize that there is more to this story than what you may immediately see in the picture. And I'm going to tell you about that in a little while. But first, let's look at another picture. Let's look at the picture that we heard a moment ago from Neftali, uh, who read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. The Apostle Paul gives us a powerful picture of two groups, Jews and Gentiles, who had experienced centuries of hostility and division, now being brought together into the one family of God, made one new humanity, a, a new creation. I mean, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. These two groups who for so long were so divided now are brought together. How did this happen? I mean, how is this even possible? Well, because of what God has done in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. 
I mean, listen to what Paul writes. Paul says, for he, being Christ, is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one. And he has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. Now, no doubt, Paul has in mind the physical dividing wall of the temple that had built, uh, been built in Jerusalem by Herod the Great. First temple was by Solomon. This would have been the second temple by Herod. And the temple was the physical dwelling place of God on earth. It was the place where the Hebrews believed that heaven and earth were joined together. They overlapped. And in the temple, uh, there were several courts with dividing walls where only certain groups could enter. So you can see a picture of it here. Um, and the, there were those, the priests, who could be kind of closest to the Holy of Holies, which was to be closest to God. And then there was a wall, and then there was a place for the Hebrew men, and then there was a wall, and then there was a place for the women, the Hebrew women, and there was a wall. But all the way out, really outside the temple, was something called the Gentile court. And, and this is the place where Gentiles were allowed. They could look up and they could view the temple, but they were not allowed to enter into it. They, they couldn't mix with the race of the Hebrews who believed themselves to be superior. So when Paul's talking about the dividing wall, no doubt he's thinking about that dividing wall within the temple, but, but he's thinking about more than that. He's also thinking about the whole religious system the Jewish laws and the codes and the way that they created divisions and a dividing, uh, dividing wall. I mean, listen, listen again to what Paul writes. He says, Christ has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and he proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. For through him, both of us have access in the spirit to the one father. One of the striking things that Paul is saying here is, is that both Gentiles and Jews are alienated from God because of their sin. It's not just the Gentiles who would have been, uh, you know, the, those who were non-Jewish. It's not just the Gentiles who were far away from God because of their sin. But Paul is saying something so striking that the, that the Jewish people themselves are alienated from God because of sin. But Paul cries out, but now, those two words, but now, in Christ, you have been brought near. Both Gentiles and Jews who have, have now access to the Father are brought back into right relationship with God. That's what reconciliation is all about. And again, this is because of, of what God has done in Christ. In his life, death, and resurrection, Paul says it once more. He says, Jesus is our peace. By that, Paul doesn't mean peace in the sense of just absence of conflict. But it's this really robust biblical vision of shalom, of all things that have gone wrong uh, being made right. It, it's pieces, it's not just the absence of conflict, but it's, it's the presence of justice. Paul says Jesus himself is our peace. In his death on the cross, he's killed the hostility between us and God. And now we all, through faith in Christ by the Spirit, have access to the Father. We can all be put in right relationship with God. It begins with reconciliation with God, but Paul goes further. He says, to be reconciled with God through Christ also means that now we are able to be reconciled with one another. Now Jesus is not just mixing together the Jews and the Gentiles into a single group, but Paul says that, that he has brought them together and has created one new humanity in place of the two, a new creation. Paul writes elsewhere, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, male or female, but Christ is all in all, and you are all in one, uh, you are all one in Christ. What Paul means by that is he's not saying that, that, that God suddenly in bringing us together just cancels out our diversity and, and, and just kind of makes us all the same. This is not about uniformity, it's about unity. It's about the diversity that we have in our unity. 
So Paul goes on then to, to use three different metaphors to describe this new humanity. He's talking about the church, what it means to be this new creation. Listen to these images that he uses. Paul says, so you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints. Paul uses the metaphor of being citizens in God's kingdom. This international and interracial kingdom uh, that is more powerful and more beautiful than any earthly nation or empire. Paul is saying that ultimately now, for everyone who calls Christ Lord, our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus in the kingdom. Paul then changes the metaphor and, and makes it more intimate. So we're not just citizens together of the kingdom of God, but Paul says you also are members of the household of God. That Jews and Gentiles together are now siblings in God's family, brothers and sisters in Christ. And then lastly, Paul says we are God's holy temple. That as a people, we are being built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ himself as the cornerstone. And in him, the whole structure, says Paul, is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, into whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. In other words, what Paul is saying is that we as the church are now the dwelling place of God. The church is not bricks and mortar, it's not a facility, but it's a people, it's a community, a new creation in which God's very presence is now made visible. We've learned so much about the church being the people over the last several months. Paul says two really important things then about what it means to be the church. And I think two very important things for this cultural moment right now. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize these as strongly as I can. Here's the two things that he says. He says, as this new humanity, this new creation, in which all the, the, the dividing walls are now brought down, he says the church then is called to be a sign and a foretaste of God's kingdom. The church is called to be a sign and a foretaste of peace, justice, and reconciliation. In other words, the church is called to be a demonstration of this. The, the church is called to show the world a picture of, of how racial unity, and really unity that overcomes all divisions, is possible through Christ. I mean, it's like Paul is saying that, that God points to the church and says to the world, do you want to see what reconciliation and peace and justice looks like? Look at the way in which they interact with one another. You know, what this stirs up for me, friends, is just this question. When the world looks at the church right now, what does it see? In this moment, right now, are we showing the world what it means to to confront racism and division, to embrace and love one another as fellow image bearers of God. Dr. King's observation over 50 years ago, it still stings and it rings true when he said that Sunday mornings remain one of the most racially segregated hours of the week in North America. And I wonder why is this still true? What, what needs to change? This, this call then to be a sign and a foretaste of the kingdom, to embody justice and rec racial reconciliation, it, it's not about becoming colorblind. And I think often I hear that, that we think, well, well does this mean, we, let's, do we need to be colorblind? And, and I love the way that Latasha Morrison puts it in her book, Be the Bridge, Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Reconciliation. She says, in the love of the family of God, we must become color brave, color caring, color honoring, and not color blind. We have to recognize the image of God in one another. We have to love despite and even because of our differences. I love that. It's a call to be color brave, color caring, color honoring. Again, God loves diversity. So the church, the body of Christ then, is called to give the world a picture of this diversity, of this unity in Christ. But Paul takes it one important step further. He says the church is not just called to be a demonstration, but the church is called to be God's primary instrument of the kingdom in the world, God's primary vehicle through which God is bringing about healing and reconciliation in the world. I mean, we have to hear 2 Corinthians chapter 5 then alongside Ephesians 2. Listen to what Paul writes. Paul says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. 
Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And all of this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us, you and me, this ministry of reconciliation, not counting their trespasses against him, but entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. Can I just let that, that phrase sit in this space today? For we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. God is bringing about his healing and reconciliation through us. So how do we do this? If the church is called to be a picture, a sign and a foretaste of unity and racial reconciliation and, and called to be an instrument, how, how do we do this? Where do we begin? And friends, this is where I just need to exercise some humility this morning and say to you, I don't know that I have the answers. In fact, right now I feel like God is calling me to get honest about some of the most important questions. And this morning, I wanna invite you into engaging those questions with me. How, how, how do we do this? How do we live in to this vision and this calling that God has given us as the church? One of my convictions is that it begins with listening. I think it's, it begins with learning to listen to others who have a different experience than us. It, it begins with humility. And I think especially for those of us who are part of the white majority culture, it begins with humility and a willingness to learn. And it begins with looking into our own hearts. It begins with asking the Spirit to help us become more self-aware, wondering what is it that we don't know that we don't know? What is it that we can't see in ourselves in terms of where bias and, and prejudice and, and maybe even racism is showing up? This is such a hard thing to ask and to talk about because we maybe find ourselves getting defensive. And yet the truth is, is that all of us, no matter what your skin color, all of us have bias and prejudice. It's, it's inescapable. The important thing then is that we're asking God to help us see where, where is this showing up in ways that maybe I'm not aware. I believe that the path to healing and reconciliation, it, it begins with each of us. And I've been so convicted over the last couple of weeks, I, I think it begins with me. As the lead pastor of this church, I think it begins with our staff and with our other leaders, for those of us who are in positions of power. Uh, we got to lead the way. And I'm giving my word to you today that, that, that I'm taking this work on. And we're gonna be having some conversations together about what does it mean for us to really seek to be a, a church that, that, is, that is embracing this call to be ministers of reconciliation. Well, I wanna close this morning then uh, by going back to that picture that I began with, that photograph. Do you remember it? And I asked that question, that do, do you know about who, who this, this white man is in the photo, and, and is there more to the story than just what we see? The white man in the photo, his name is Peter Norman, and he was an unknown Australian sprinter uh, who, who seemingly came out of nowhere and ended up taking the silver medal in the 200 meter race. The final heat was an amazing race, but what happened on the podium was even more amazing. This is the part of the story that most people don't know. So in 1968, it wasn't only the US who was experiencing racial injustice. Apartheid was, was happening also in Australia, uh, and one nearly as bad as South Africa. There was tension and protests in the streets of Australia following heavy apartheid restrictions on non-white immigra uh, immigration and discriminatory laws against the Aboriginal people. So the two Americans asked Norman if he believed in human rights. And Norman said that he did. And they then asked him if he believed in God. And Norman was part of the Salvation Army and he said that he had a strong belief in God. He was a devout uh, follower of Christ. Carlos recalls that conversation. He says, we knew that what we were going to do was far greater than any athletic feat. And Norman said to us, I want to stand with you. I want to stand with you. 
He said, I expected to see fear in Norman's eyes, but instead, all we saw was love. So when Norman had heard that they were going to make this gesture of defiance on the podium with their badges and black gloves, he asked them if they had another badge. They didn't, so he scrambled and found one to borrow from another athlete. And then, together, as one, these three men walked out onto the podium. And when the Star Spangled Banner started to play and be sung, uh, the crowd was so moved by the picture of what they saw, these three men standing together, that the song faded and the stadium fell into a hushed silence. You know, I shared with you the cost of what this meant for the two American runners and the price that they paid. But there was also a cost for Norman. Even though he would remain for years one of the fastest sprinters in his country, the Australian Olympic team refused to ever let him race again in the Olympics. This act essentially cost him his career. His entire family was ostracized, and they were made outcasts in their own country. No one would hire Norman, and he finally found a job as a butcher, but he was injured and, and contracted gangrene, which led to depression and alcoholism. For years, the authorities in his country promised to treat him and his family differently if he would only condemn his co-athletes, Carlos and Smith, if he would only condemn their disobedient gesture at the 1968 Olympics. They even promised that if he would do this, that they would let him compete in the Olympics again. But Norman wouldn't do it. He would not condemn his brothers and his friends. He stood his ground. Norman died suddenly from a heart attack in 2006 without his country ever apologizing for the way that they had treated him. An official apology would come in 2012, but by then it was too late. At his funeral, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, Norman's friends since that moment in 1968, were his pallbearers, sending him off as a hero. He stood with them in life, and now they vowed that they would stand with him in his death. Tommy Smith explained, he paid the price with his choice. It wasn't just a simple gesture to help us. It was his fight. He was a white man, a white Australian man among two men of color, standing up in this moment of victory, standing with us, all of us standing together in the name of the same thing. Norman made his choice, a courageous choice, a choice that demanded sacrifice, a choice that brought with, us, uh, brought with it an enormous cost. And friends, he never regretted it. I wonder, what choices are in front of us today? What choices are in front of you individually, are in front of us as a church, as a community, as a nation? When asked why he made that choice, let me share with you what Norman said in his own words. I couldn't see why a black man couldn't drink the same water from a water fountain, or take the same bus, or go to the same school as a white man. There was a social injustice that I couldn't do anything from from where I was, but I certainly hated it. It has been said that my sharing the silver medal with that incident on that victory platform detracted from my performance. But I tell you, on the contrary, I have to confess, I was rather proud to be a part of it. A picture paints a thousand words. A single photograph can tell a powerful story. Friends, it was true then, and it's true now. Trinity Church, let us together be a picture of God's kingdom, a picture of God's reconciling love in Christ for all the world to see. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray.
Jesus, you came in order to bring down the dividing walls. Your life and your ministry was all about reconciliation, all about bringing people together and making them into this new humanity, this new creation. And we thank you that you take us in our sin and brokenness, we who are far off, and you reconcile us to the Father. And not only that, but you reconcile us to one another. And you call us now to be a part of this ministry of reconciliation in the world, to, to lead the way, even in our own community, in our region, to be bridge builders, all in the name of you, O Lord, and in the power of your spirit. Father, I don't know what's getting stirred up for each of us this morning, but we take a moment right now just to be present and wanting to listen. God, how are you stirring us? What are, what are, how are you calling us personally to respond today? How are you calling us to get into action? Lord, we take a moment to listen to your spirit now. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and courage for the living of these days that we truly might be a picture of your kingdom and an instrument of your kingdom that is all about this work of reconciliation that you're doing. In the name of Christ we pray and all God's people said, amen.